Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do a companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net if you have suggestions for topics guests and other ideas please send them to info@scientificsense.com and i can be reached at gil at epen.info my guest today is lee badget who is a professor of economics and co-director of the center for employment equity at the university of massachusetts amherst she is also a williams distinguished scholar at ucla's williams institute Her research focuses on economic inequality for LGBT people, including wage gaps, employment discrimination, and poverty, uh, and on the global cost of homophobia and transphobia. Her latest book is The Economic Case for LGBT Equality, Why Fair and Equal Treatment Benefits Us All. Welcome, Lee. Thanks, Gil. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Sure yeah I want to start with the economic case for LGBT inclusion and that is really the topic of your latest book uh but I want to uh, sort of look at the micro uh, problem first um I know that you focused on uh country wide issues uh when I went to business school uh, now in prehistoric times uh we were taught that our job is to maximize shareholder value Uh, when I went to work, I quickly found out that it's not something that the managers of the firm typically worry about. Their objective function is much simpler, and it includes maximizing self-importance and self-worth. Uh, but if this uh, principal agent problem did not exist in firms, anything other than inclusion of all will be irrational. Uh, economists win Nobel prizes proving, I would say, such commonsensical ideas, but business schools. do not teach it even now for unknown reasons so the managers of firms uh, or the consultants they hire or the investment bankers who make deals for them may not have a good sense of how value is created in the firm uh so so will making an economic case for inclusion have any practical effects within firms <laughs> I think it can, but I think it doesn't happen on its own and I think that's kind of what you're saying. I mean, economists talk at this very high abstract level about um uh, about incentives uh to to do the thing that will maximize shareholder value or whatever it is and uh and exactly what you just said uh is important to to take into account, you know, that there are people at the other end of these theories and what they do might be guided by theories but it might be uh, that you need a lot of of uh of people to fill in the gap right between yeah. the theory and the practice and i think um uh although i am an economist i like to think of myself as also a practical person with some knowledge about institutions and in the real world and and what we know is a lot of times uh employers only change their policies when their employees come to them and say Hey, let's talk. We think we're being treated unfairly and uh yeah. uh you may not realize it, but let's tell you kind of what's going on. So this is actually how a lot of change took place in corporate America related to LGBT people and LGBT rights. This has been going on for decades now. Um and in many ways corporations were ahead of the game. 
uh, in the U.S. Uh, ahead of policymakers. But anyway, so they, you know, they talked to their employees, and, and what their employees said was, um, you know, we think it's it's the right thing to do to to treat us the same way. So if you give part, if you give healthcare benefits to spouses of employees, and you should give them to our same-sex partners, you know, even back when same-sex couples couldn't get married, especially then, in fact. Right. Um, and uh, and they said, you know, that's that's treating us equally. But they also said, um, and and here's why it's in your interest to do this, is because if, if uh, one of your competitors for highly skilled labor offers those benefits, then you're going to lose people. They're not going to want to come work for you. They're going to leave their jobs. They're going to take the skills that they've gained and they're going to go work for your competitors. And you don't want that to happen. Um, if you don't do this, then you've got employees who are going to be sitting in the office doing their jobs, but also maybe worrying about how their uh, how their uh, spouses or their partner's health care is going to get paid for, how their kid's health care is going to get paid for. That's not good for their productivity. So you don't want them to be unproductive. Um, and, you know, those kinds of arguments were the sorts of things that resonated with employers. The other kind of thing that people would, would argue is, you know, gay people buy things. They buy services, financial services. They buy uh, they buy cars, they buy houses, you know, and you don't want to alienate a potentially important and lucrative part of your market. So there were lots of reasons that lots of reasons that were mobilized by, you know, the LGBT people in those workplaces to make that argument. And as it turned out, uh, the employers often, often bought those arguments. I mean, they actually could see the logic to, yeah. to the arguments. So, so this is something that's been happening at the corporate level for a long time, making those kinds of arguments. And I don't know if you if you follow, you know, the Supreme Court cases or yeah, marriage yeah. and yeah. You know, some of the other uh, non discrimination cases, uh, the one that came out most recently. But um, uh, employers were filing friend of the court briefs in those cases, making exactly these same kinds of arguments, saying, "Yeah, we think that everybody should uh, should." Uh, be able to to uh, come to work uh, without fear of discrimination, and we try to create those kinds of workplaces. Um, and so, you know, we think that the f we should have federal laws protecting those workers from discrimination. That's the good thing to do. It's good for businesses like ours. Same thing for for same sex marriage. Many uh, hundreds of employers signed these briefs saying to the Supreme Court. Yeah, we want to treat our employers fairly, but we cannot. You're also hold you know holding us back. We can't, we can't treat them in the same way that we do different sex couples when, you know, when we might want to transfer them to a state where they don't, they are not allowed to marry and their marriage won't be recognized. Or, you know, when they pay more in taxes for, uh, for healthcare benefits for their partners, um, you know, that, that, that's bad for our business too. So when employers um, get it, so, you know, employees com complain, we have protests, when employers get it, are they getting it because they want to minimize costs or are they getting it to maximize the value of the firm? The reason I ask is, hmm. you know, um, there is, there is, you know, you can observe a lot of these things. For example, you know, we put the board between uh, C-level execs and shareholders if you go into a board meeting and you find 16 clones who look exactly like you, it should generally tell you there is something wrong. But I recently heard a, um, a large airline CEO saying, hey, I have to pay attention to it. And I, you know, if you haven't paid attention to it <laughs> now and you just found out, you know, this is a problem. I wonder if it's a cost minimization activity rather than, you know, really kind of tackling the problem. What do you think? Uh -huh. Well, I think that two things happen when employees come in and make this case to their employers. Um, I mean, in one, in one aspect of it is certainly the cost minimization, the kind of wanting to, to do the, uh, to, to do the thing that's good for the business. But, you know, a lot of employers often want to do the right thing. And when they meet people, and they hear their employees talk about their lives and, uh, uh, and, and develop some kind of understanding of the challenges that LGBT people face. A lot of them seem to have um, 
uh, seem to get it and they seem to understand that it's also kind of the morally right thing to do, that there's larger human costs to, to dignity and to, uh, and to people feeling fully included, not just in the workplace, but just in general. And they do care about those things. And yeah. studies that have, have uh, where uh, CEOs have been interviewed, uh, where, where that um, clearly makes a difference. There have been cases where, the CEOs may have kids who turn out to be LGBT mm-hmm. and they, they're sort of, you know, they, they change how they, how they see, uh, how they see these issues. So I think it's, it's, it's really kind of, it's really sort of both in this particular case, you know, the, the right thing to do on a moral level for a human rights on a human rights level is the right thing to do from a, a business perspective as well. So, so, you know, that should make it easier actually, I think for, for employers to, to be willing to go along with this. And it does seem like that's what's happened because many, many firms have changed their policies without being required to do so. Right. Right. Yeah. So I want to jump into the, the book. Um, so uh, in the book, you have you have looked at sort of the macro effects of this, right? Countrywide effects. Um, uh, it, when you have certain rights, uh, you looked at GDP, GDP growth, and things like that. Uh, could you could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, because I think you know all the things that we've talked about so far are really kind of at that that micro level, but. Um, one of the tests of the idea that uh, that there's an economic case for equality is to look at it at this larger mm-hmm. level. So I, there's a couple of different ways to do it. I mean, one way is to compare countries and to look at the countries that are uh, that have more supportive laws, more supportive people, more supportive of LGBT people in them, and see how well they do economically uh, compared to the countries that are not so supportive. So I've done this in a number of different ways, using both laws as a measure of support and also public opinion. And then um, I've looked at how that affects, you know, the variation of, uh, of GDP, as you just mentioned, but also taking into account the other things that matter for GDP. So things that aren't LGBT related, but are about, you know, the stock of human capital, the stock of physical capital, the, you know, the workforce, um, other kinds of things that are specific to countries. And, um, and what we have found very consistently is that the companies that have better policies or more accepting people um, have higher levels of GDP. So there is this correlation, clearly a correlation, positive correlation between, you know, having, uh, being more equal for LGBT people and having stronger economies. So that's kind of the, that's the one way to look at it at the macro level. Yeah. The other way, yeah. The other way that I've done it, I'll just say kind of quickly is to, to take all those micro pieces, looking at what happens to people in, in their workplaces and what the cost of discrimination might be. Um, taking into account some of the other costs to to societies when when there's uh, exclusion of LGBT people with regard to health, for example. So looking at higher the higher rates of suicidality or depression or HIV or violence in in, in some countries, um, and um, uh, thinking about how much lower those costs would be uh, if there were more acceptance. And so when you take those and try to try to cost them out, basically. Yeah. Um, what you find is that it adds up to quite a bit. LGBT people um, are not a huge part of our population, but in the cases uh, that I have done it in India and in the Philippines, and I know others who've, who've done similar kinds of calculations in Kenya and in South Africa, what you find is it adds up. So uh, about uh, you know, kind of the overlap of all those different estimates is about 1% of GDP. Um, so that's a much more of a kind of a causal effect. You're sort of saying, you know, here's what happens to LGBT people and here's how that adds up to the cost of the economy. So in, so both looking at it that way and looking at it across countries, you can see in a really tangible way what the, what the cost might be. Right, right. Yeah, I sometimes wonder, uh, Lee, I want to get your perspective on this. You know, is, is inclusion an attribute of how advanced a society is? Uh, and if so, you know, it would be correlated with a lot of different things, uh, including happiness and, and potentially economics as well. And, you know, if you sort of rewind time, um, 50,000 years ago when Homo sapiens started, we had no inclusion. We had clans who did not admit people from other clans. Uh, and we progressively um, changed that over time. So we have increasing inclusion 
Uh, in that context, is inclusion really an attribute of how advanced the society might be? Well, I think that's a that's a tricky question. I mean, if you think about advancement as you know having stronger economies um, or other things that we think would be good for uh, good outcomes like happiness or like uh, less e inequality overall, those kinds of things. I mean, I think. Um, I think it's likely that there that there are some kinds of connections there. I, have, I, I think that the pathways might be a little bit different, but yeah. uh, but I think uh, I think it's it's entirely um, it's entirely possible that that will matter. I think it's it gets complicated though because a lot of things are going to happen at the same time. So I'll just give you an example of that. Those macro studies where we've looked at the impact of laws on uh, on GDP. We tried to take into account some of the other things that you might think would also happen, like having more gender equality, for example. Yeah. Um, and so we did include a measure of that in some of those studies. We looked at how many, what, what was the proportion of a parliament or a Congress that was uh, where the elected officials were women. And um, we used that as a, as a measure. Um, and what we found was that actually, even after you take that into account, you still see a very strong positive effect of the LGBT laws or LGBT acceptance on, on GDP. So, so I think it, it, you know, it, it looks like it's possible that it has a very independent sort of effect, but it's also probably, uh, it's also probably the, as we would say in economics, you know, the causation is kind of going in both directions yeah. um, because you know, when economies are doing uh, are doing better, um, it may be that those uh, those societies are more open to human rights. And there's a whole theory about this in political science called the post-materialist hypothesis. I don't, do you, are you familiar with that? Uh, I know. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting idea because uh, the argument is, as societies uh, as economies grow and get stronger, um, people don't have to worry quite so much just about basic subsistence. Mm. And so that opens up the possibilities of, you know, loosening up existing traditions. So societies might become more secular or they might, uh, they might rely less on kind of a, a traditional authority as the structure that kind of holds everything together. And um, there might be more room for thinking about individual rights just in general. And so uh, you might also have more time to spend on organizing social movements and <laughs> there might be more openness to them. So, so if, so you can also imagine that, um, that, that economies that are, that are stronger, growing faster, uh, having higher levels of uh, per capita GDP are also going to be places where LGBT people will be more accepted. So uh, it's a little bit hard to, to know, um, you know, how much of the correlation that we see kind of comes from that direction. Right. Um, just to be totally honest about it, and that's going to take more research to, to sort that out. But at the same time, I do point back to the, to those, uh, models that have built up from the differences, from the challenges that we see for LGBT people and show how those are costly, the cost of discrimination, the cost of, of health disparities. Um, so I think, you know, that's, um, it's important to kind of think about it both from the macro and the micro at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's you know, unusual for economists, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it, I think that's, that's the way you have to think about it to see what these connections are. Right. Right. Have you, have you looked at uh, longitudinally, um, you know, this type of effect anywhere? Yeah. Well, we, that's what, how we did this, these cross country okay. studies. We did have data over time. So uh Sometimes, depending on the group of countries that we were studying, um, uh, but for the the largest study, we went back to the 1960s. So we had data on laws going back to the 60s, and so we could we could control for uh, what we call country fixed effects. We could say, you know, it's basically let's look inside the countries right. <laughs> um, and hold constant what those, you know, the specific characteristics of countries might be, and then uh, and see how that then how it varies, uh, how uh, GDP varies with, uh, with uh, acceptance or, or better laws. And, and we still see that, um, that positive effect over time. And, you know, I'm hoping that sometime in the future we'll, we'll have the ability, the kind of data that we'll need to, uh, you know, to look at changes in laws and to see if that's, you know, if they happen first and then we, and then we see changes in, um, in, uh, in GDP. Um, but we haven't had a chance to do that yet.
Yeah, I know that you looked at some data from India too. I'm sort of curious about it uh, because it's uh, it's a nice experiment. Um, you know, post independence uh, about 70 years ago, um, it was set up uh, sort of like a secular country. And uh, I don't know if data shows anything. Uh, there are some trends uh, of late that uh, that it may not be right. So, so you know, we would generally expect a uh, a society to get better over time. So, have you seen any trends that goes the other way? We definitely see trends uh, uh, for many countries where both um, acceptance is going up and where the number of laws, supportive laws that have passed is going up. You know, India is a good example. Just even just a few years ago, they, they didn't have very many of the basic um, kinds of laws that we've used as, a, as measures of inclusion. You know, but things are changing very rapidly. Just a couple of years ago, the Indian Supreme Court struck down laws that criminalize homosexuality. Yeah. A few years before that, they they took a very strong stand and said transgender people must be you know treated equally and fairly, and they have to have the opportunity to to live their lives, and they're treated as a, as like a special caste, a special group um, uh, as well uh, with regard to other policies. Um, and there are discussions about non discrimination laws. There are discussions. Many corporations are now being much more um, inclusive of LGBT people in India. So there's a lot of change happening um, in those countries. So we definitely. So India is really one of those countries that's in the um, in the category of, of seeing very clear improvements. However, there are other countries that are not seeing such great improvements. I mean, we can see, you know, uh, regression and. Uh, in countries like uh, like Uganda and Nigeria that have passed laws that um, make it um, even harder, that, that sort of super criminalize homosexuality and make it harder for people, for allies to speak out in favor of LGBT people or to um, to have uh, to have organizations in support of LGBT rights. We see the same thing in Russia. We see, you know, we see this and, in, 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 you know, we even see some backlash here in the United States when some of the things that uh, have been in place for several years have been dismantled by the, the current administration. So, you know, so there's always a little tension, you know, uh, and um, but then there's some countries that are really kind of clearly sort of uh, regressing um, in terms of uh, in terms of acceptance, um, mm. I think in, in Poland, the, the president who was just reelected has has been a strong opponent of, of LGBT uh, people and LGBT rights. So there's there, there are many challenges in, in lots of different parts of the world. Yeah, you, you looked at some survey data too, right? So asking people how open they are, and um, there is significant difference um, between countries there. Um, yeah. And, you know, I sometimes wonder, laws are one thing, uh, but the more important thing I would imagine from a societal perspective is how people feel. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So do you see any correlations between how people feel and how how countries enacted laws in this area? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I know, I think there's a political scientist who've looked at that and they do see that... uh, uh, that attitudes matter. Uh, they're positively, cor- you know, the, the more accepting people are, um, the more uh, supportive laws tend to be. That is not always a one-to-one correspondence. I mean, in the United States, for example, you know, we've had public opinion has been way ahead on some issues like non-discrimination policies, way ahead of policy, whereas it took a long time for kind of opinion about marriage equality to catch up with the law. Um uh, but in uh, yeah, so there is there is that correlation. I think um, uh, what was I going to say about that? Uh, I, I think there. If you're thinking though about how to really define inclusion, those both of those kind of give us some, give LGBT people some space yeah. uh, to operate in, and th- so they're both important. What we still don't have though is a lot of good data on. On what this looks like from the LGBT perspective. So, so how well are LGBT people doing in in all these different countries? Are they more likely to be poor than other people? Are they uh, are their incomes lower than than they should be given their skills and experience? How's their health? You know, those kinds of things are really hard to measure still. And uh, there's actually been an interesting effort 
that the UN Development Program and the World Bank have been working on to create a, a global index. They call it the LGBTI Inclusion Index. Yeah. That extra I and LGBT stands for intersex people. Uh, so they are advocating for uh, for countries to to start collecting better data on LGBT people so that we can actually make those kinds of comparisons, you know, in terms of people's lived experience, not just, you know, kind of what the law might allow, uh, but you might still have to fight for and contest. And it's not just about public acceptance, but what people really feel in their day-to-day -day lives. So, so I think, you know, my, I'm hopeful that over time we'll have more and more good data that we can, we can really dig into. Yeah. Yeah. And you looked at wage gaps specifically, right? Um, was that by country or? We have, we have some data on wage gaps from several countries. It's yeah. mostly, it's the United States, it's Australia, it's Western European countries. We're starting to get some data from some Latin American countries. And actually, it's a, it's a really interesting kind of pattern. I mean, so for men, for gay and bisexual men, um, we actually see that they earn less than straight men do. Um, and uh, it's, you know, on average across the countries that have been studied, it's about 11% less. Mm -hmm. So that's people who have the same education, same kinds of jobs, same level of experience. They're, they are are the same in all the ways that should matter, except that some are gay and bisexual. So that wage gap is is uh, something that's pretty common across countries. When you look at women, it's you get a somewhat different mm -hmm. picture. So lesbian and bisexual women, and a lot of these surveys that have been done, it looks like they actually earn more than heterosexual women do. So that's pretty interesting. But I think what that reflects is that um, that the lesbians are less likely to be um, to be tied to families or husbands. They may be able to, uh, or they and they may need to actually invest more in their own skills uh, and knowledge so that they do well in the labor force because they don't they are not going to have a man's income to to count on. Um, they're a little bit less likely to have kids, but there's still lots of them do have kids. But even so, uh, we see that they earn a little bit more, um, something around on average about 9% more than the heterosexual women yeah. do. So, um, yeah, so for the gay men, I would argue that wage gap is kind of a measure of their productivity loss, right? Of being steered into jobs that they're either overqualified for or not getting jobs that they are qualified for. Um, and for the women, it's really... Uh, about, you know, in countries like the ones that have been studied, which are pretty open, relatively open for, for lesbians and gay men, LGBT people generally, they are, um, uh, the, the lesbian and bisexual women are actually sort of more productive than the heterosexual women. Our heterosexual women in general just, I think, seem to be the group that's sort of at the bottom of the of the economic ladder, um, and especially for, for um, in places where there's, you know, racial and ethnic differences, um, often women of color are, are there at the bottom. But, um, but the lesbian women are sort of uh, able to overcome some of those, some of those barriers and to, and to do better in the labor force. So we want to allow, we want openness so that they can do that, right? So, so that's kind of the challenge, I think, for, uh, for economies to fully, um, to fully take advantage of the, the skills and knowledge, the creativity, um, the commitment, work commitment of, of LGBT people. Right. Yeah. So th that's very interesting. So suppose we superimpose, I would imagine LGBT wage gaps um, is, is uh, simultaneous with gender-based wage gaps. So if we superimpose the gender-based wage gaps, will we see something like you know, for men, uh, straight men uh, earn 10 and LGBT uh, men earns nine. And you look at women and you superimpose the, the gender wage gap, um, you know, since it's eight and nine. So it's, it's, it's almost like um, people in the LGBT bucket, whether it's, I'm just making, <laughs> I'm making this hypothesis to tell me if it's wrong. Uh, you don't find a lot of gender based uh, gender-based wage gap in the LGBT bucket is that is that possible? Unfortunately, that's not <laughs> what happens. Yeah, so there actually are differences between yeah lesbians and gay men. Yeah, um, so it's you know if you had to sort of like put people in order of how well yeah. they do, the heterosexual men would be at the top, then it would be like the gay men earning about nine cents on the you know ninety cents on the dollar, and then the lesbians would be somewhere below that. 
but still above the heterosexual women. And in the U.S., I think the you know the wage gap right now is about eight, is about uh, eighty uh, twenty percent. So it's a, the heterosexual women make about twenty twenty uh, eighty. 80 cents on the dollar. Um, and uh, the lesbians are kind of somewhere in between that 80 and 90 percent. Yeah, but, but in general, though, the gender wage gap will be lower uh, in the LGBT cohort. Uh, is, it, is it because um, when, when a firm hires LGBT, uh, you know, somebody from that LGBT cohort, it's already forward looking firm. Yeah, so, so I'm asking, is, is there a kind of a firm wide data that might tell us how that gap is moving, both LGBT as well as gender? Yeah, great question. I wish we had that data. We don't. Um, but but I would say I think the main reason why that gap is a little bit smaller between lesbians and gay men is just because the gay men are earning right. less, you know, uh, so they're being treated you know, more like women are in that sense, because they're getting, uh, they're ending up with lower earnings. And the women are, you know, doing a bit better because they work more hours, they work more of the year, and they may have more experience than the heterosexual women do. So, so it's kind of a combination of both of those things. But, you know, for the, for lesbians, they're, they're facing both those challenges. I mean, they're, they're facing everything that, that women face, but then they were also potentially, you know, facing discrimination because of being lesbians. There's a whole other set of studies that are, that are uh, really interesting. They're kind of experiments. We don't get to do experiments very often in economics, but we're doing them more. Yeah. more. And you can take two resumes uh, and th that are pretty much identical uh, in terms of people's experience, where they live, where they went to school. And if you label one of them in some way as being probably somebody who's LGBT, like saying I was in the LGBT, uh, my college LGBT group, um, and you don't have that on the other resume, and you send both of them out there, both those hypothetical people to apply for jobs. What we find is that the the gay or the lesbian applicant actually is much less likely to get invited for an interview than the uh, than the one that's not labeled as LGBT. So let's call that the heterosexual person. So uh, so even though lesbians kind of look like they're doing better, you know, they're still likely to experience discrimination if they're really open. Um, and uh, so it's 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 not clear that that advantage is something you can really take advantage of, you know, so you can't like should you go out and put that on your resume before you apply for a job? Hey, I'm a lesbian. I'm not going to, you know, uh, uh, not going going to fulfill all your gender expectations. No, that's probably not a good idea because because we know that there is this other kind of discrimination. Yeah, yeah. I know that you have been looking at this historically also, Lee. So, you know, except for the unusual regime that we are in today, uh, it sounds like you are generally optimistic that things are improving in the U.S. context. Yeah, I mean, I, I like being an optimist. Um, definitely, if you take the long view, um, you can see positive changes, I think. Um, I think uh, the history of marriage equality is a great example in the U.S. where it was just kind of unimaginable um, 30 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and if you would ask people and do surveys, you know, hardly anyone in the public would be in favor of marriage equality. I think in the mid nineties, it was like one in four people in the U S were in favor. And then now, you know, we not only have national uh, marriage equality, but uh, you know, 60, two thirds of people in the United States agree that marriage equality is a good thing. So people's minds have changed. People's, the, our policies have changed. People's LGBT people's ability to live their lives has changed and has improved. I think, you know, there's still a lot of tension because it doesn't help everybody. Um, there's certainly um, a lot of ways in which some of the things that have changed for the better are going to help uh, more middle class LGBT people more. Um, you know, we I've been doing other research that shows that uh, poverty is very common in the LGBT community, especially for transgender people, for example. And um, and it's not clear that we have a that we figured out a good way to even understand what's going on there um, and much less to actually. Um, develop policies that are going to improve people's lives at the at the very lowest end of the income distribution. So there's still a lot of work left to do. Even though I'm I'm I, I'd like to see the positive side of things that have changed over the over the longer right, haul. Right. Yeah. So in conclusion, Lee, you know, if you look forward five years, um, what what do you what do you realistically think? I, I'm talking the U.S. context now. What do you realistically think we will be at five years from now? 
Um, and more importantly, what do you think are the specific sort of policy and firm wide or firm level, I should say, actions uh, that you anticipate um, happening in those five years? Okay, well, let's start with the firm yeah. side because I feel more confident about predictions there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I, you know, I think that the the genuine change that's happened in a lot of companies will continue. Um, I think we, we're seeing um, companies still still evolving in terms of what that means. I mean, it doesn't just mean non-discrimination policies and partner benefits anymore. Now it means, you know, how are you, what kind of training are you giving your employees about LGBT issues? How are you managing transgender people's transitions in the workplace? What are you doing when there's, when there's anti-LGBT legislation proposed where you operate? And you know, so companies, for example, are, are much, uh, many more companies are taking public stands, um, not just in favor of positive laws, but against the negative ones. Um, um, we're seeing companies, uh, I've been doing some case studies of IBM, um, and they were a pioneer in, uh, in something that they call self-ID, that letting employees tell the company, their employer, that they are, they do identify as LGBT. That way, that's good for for uh, LGBT workers because they can find each other. The employ uh, employer can help them find each other. It's good for the employer because they, if they want to make sure they have a diverse, you know, pool for leadership development, for example, that they um, that they're tapping, be able to know if they're tapping into LGBT people, they can invite people in. So, so those kinds of changes, I think, are things that firms are going to continue in the future. You know, looking more broadly, I think it's 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 a challenge. I mean, I think there are uh, um, the the most recent Supreme Court decision that said that LGBT people are covered by the Civil Rights Act of 1964 um, against discrimination by employers is really important. You know, they said you know, yes, sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination are basically a f forms of sex discrimination. So that's already illegal. So that's all very positive. But there's still lots of other aspects of of uh, discrimination that are not prevented by that. So there, you know, I think there's a lot of room for legislation um, at the federal level to deal with credit and housing, and public accommodations. Those are all going to be important issues to deal with. Um, there are, uh, you know, ongoing challenges around transgender people in the military about how, you know, federal policy will, um, will treat LGBT people's issues in, in every possible context from health to child welfare policies. So there's, there's a lot that's, that's at stake that's still in play. Now, what direction will that go? I mean, there's like, there's two very plausible scenarios that are completely the opposite, <laughs> going in the opposite direction, I think, you know, and it's all going to depend a lot on what happens in the election in the fall. I think, uh, you know, if we're going to have, you know, a continuation of the current administration, then, you know, there, there will be many battles. There will be many continued battles over these issues. I think, uh, you know, uh, there's another uh, candidate whose, whose policies are going to be much more amenable to, uh, to uh, LGBT people's rights and codifying those rights, supporting um, administrative efforts as well as legislative and judicial efforts to uh, to ensure those rights are um, enforced. So, so it's very hard to predict that. You know, uh, you, I guess you could just kind of fill in the blank of who, what you think is going to happen in November and sort of guess which path I think you know uh, we're likely to go. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess the thing is, you know, I guess the sum, summary is there's some things that I feel like are, there's a lot of momentum, you know, uh, on the workplace side. There's a lot, it's a lot less clear kind of on the policy yeah, side. Yeah, you know, um, I'm optimistic because of, I think, uh, two, two different things. One is the power of social media. Uh, I think, you know, uh, it's going to have a huge impact on how policies are going to be made in the future, I would imagine. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, if you have a situation where the average age of policymakers is 75 uh, and they're making policies for the 20 year olds and 30 year olds, that's not a sustainable situation. And yeah, we already yeah. see signs that, that that's going to change. And so social media coupled with uh, policymakers who are more in tune and touch with the general population uh, could substantially remove all these complications, I think. 
Yeah, I think that's right. Over the over the longer haul, I think that there has been huge uh, the, the the generational change will definitely benefit LGBT people. I don't think there's any question about that. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. This has been great, Lee. Uh, thanks so much for the time that you spent with me. And uh, thank you. I've enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, thank you. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.